We're gonna get started in just a moment. We still are allowing people to populate the room. So thank you very much for joining us. We'll get started in just a second. Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Margie Levin, and I'm the Assistant Director in ADL Southwest Regional Office. We're going to start the program in just a second, but I wanted to highlight one of our housekeeping notes, and that is that our panelists will be on video and, and able to unmute. However, you as a participant, you will be muted and will not have access to your video during this presentation. We would love for you to ask questions and you can do so by using the chat function of Zoom on the bottom of your screen to pose a question for our panelists. So to get started, I would like to introduce Rabbi David Siegel, Texas organizer for the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism. For more than six decades, the Religion, Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism, the RAC, has worked to educate, inspire, and mobilize the Reform Jewish movement to advocate for social justice. As part of that advocacy, the RAC has been a strong proponent of voting rights. And therefore, that's why we've asked Rabbi Siegel to join us as our moderator tonight. Rabbi Siegel, take it away. Thank you so much, Margie, uh, especially for putting everything together to make this program possible. Good evening, everyone. I am also grateful that you're joining us tonight because voting Southwest Regional Director of the ADL the Anti-Defamation League. ADL's mission is to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and secure justice and fair treatment to all. It requires ADL to be concerned about secure equal voting rights for all US citizens. A reminder, again, that if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A or in the chat. We'll be monitoring both. You'll find icons for those sections at the bottom of your screen. It's my privilege and pleasure tonight to introduce Dr. Bob Stein, the Lena Goldman Fox Professor of Political Science at Rice University, Faculty Director of the Center for Civic Engagement, Fellow in Urban Politics at the Baker Institute, and former Dean of the School of Social Sciences. Professor Stein is an expert on urban politics, public policy, and voting behavior, and uh, is relevant tonight, also an advisor to Harris County uh, as they run their elections. His current research, funded by the Pew Charitable Trusts, Arnold Foundation, and National Science Foundation, focuses on voting behavior, election administration, and emergency preparedness. He is, uh, as he said to me before, he's the one of the experts in the world on voting uh, during a hurricane or in the aftermath of a hurricane or a natural disaster, and now also on voting during a pandemic. Dr. Stein is sought after by media outlets for political commentary, and we are especially grateful to him because tonight is the second of a two-part webinar series on voting rights which we, in which he is our main presenter. So Dr. Stein, thank you for joining us. I know you have a lot to say about the 2020 election and how you see voting and elections going forward, but to start us off, can you comment on what effect the 2020 presidential election and the riot at the US Capitol might have on elections going forward? And you'll just have to unmute yourself. There you go. Before I get into my own PowerPoint, um, let me ask, answer the question directly. Um, some of you may be readers of the Washington Post. Um, a good friend, um, uh, Bernard Frog at Emory um, University, 
actually directly answer that question. And the, the best evidence we have, of course, is both um, the Georgia primary runoff, excuse me, the Georgia general election runoff before the uh, attack on the Capitol, and then subsequent, I'll show you some data after it. But what was most interesting was that um, the Georgia runoff election, which saw something I don't think I surely did not anticipate nor would have predicted, two um, Senate seats going to the Democrats was largely due to the um, lower turnout rate among white Republicans. Um, this isn't a poll. This isn't an exit poll. This is just looking at uh, precincts, um, which is, I think I've said to this group before, if I haven't, there are too many groups I've spoken before, precincts are almost good predictors of voters because people live in precincts with people like themselves, Democrats, Republicans, whites, Anglos, Jews, Protestants, Klingons, whatever it may be. And as a consequence, you can use a precinct and, and generally you'll see that precinct is voting either 80 or percent more Democratic or Republican. And what we saw very simply was that Republican precincts turned out at about 90, 80, 88 to 90 percent of their turnout in the general election in Georgia, Repub Democratic precincts at 96 and 97 percent. This was an election, um, the runoff election for these two Senate seats that was won largely by Democrats and by margins that were even surprising to um, those who are optimistic about Democratic victories, largely if not exclusively on voter turnout. Now, we can't predict why more Repu Democrats turned out than Republicans, but I would submit to you that the Demo Republicans had um, President Trump who campaigned and even raised money, although he may not have given all of it to the two candidates, two Republican candidates, um, by saying not that it was important to elect these two senators as a, a control against a democratically elected president, but because he, Donald Trump, had had his election or re-election stolen. He could not say the best argument for voting in these two Republicans was that that would make the Senate a majority Republican and be a ballast, if you want, to a Democratic president. He wouldn't agree to that. So what I'll show you tonight is some data that would suggest going forward. Um, my suspicions are that Donald Trump is not a unifying, but a, 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 a slightly, if not moderately, weakening position for Republicans. Um, should he not um, uh, support a candidate in the Republican primary, that candidate's not likely in key battleground states to get elected, whether it's a senator, governor, secretary of state, or congressperson. So I think the president's actions since um, January 6th have not helped, but have, 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 have hastened, I think, um, uh, at least a re rethinking of what a presidential, a next presidential um, office holder can do for a party. My sense, it weakens their part, their position. If you will indulge me, I'll kind of go through, um, let me get the uh, screen up. What I thought I would do, and I, um, this is a pretty, what I call, um, research oriented. You're getting work that I have just completed with some colleagues um, on both um, the national elections um, and local. In fact, here are the topics I'd like to talk about. I don't know if we'll get through all of them. And um, you know, I'll let David or who's moderating decide the rules if you want to ask questions during the presentation or after I'm happy to do it. One, I, I think it's important to just kind of go over the basics of what happened in this election. A lot of things I think missed our attention or didn't get underscored. These are things that some of the, in the audience may have heard me talk about if they are Rice alums or um, come to some of the continuing ed. Um, the second is on the controversy over how and where and when we voted. And this is of course what President Trump and his supporters have been calling the great election uh, fraud or steal. This is based on new research that literally just ended about two or three days ago, and I'll talk about that. Then there's another thing that's unique to Texans. We used to have straight ticket voting. You could have walked into the voting booth, hit one button, and voted for all Democrats or all Republicans. Starting in 2020, um, the legislature decided to get rid of that. And so there was some question about whether or not straight ticket voting helped Democrats, helped Republicans, hurt Democrats, hurt Republicans, made no difference. Um, why did we do it? And of course, straight ticket voting, we do know, if, I, if you remember my earlier lecture, speeds up the voting process, which is you know, a convenience, except when it's COVID. 
and sitting in line with other people might be dangerous, both to you and to others. And more importantly, straight ticket voting, which speeds the lines up, gets the voter in and out of that voting place if they're voting in person as opposed to mail in a safer way, not only for themselves, but for the poll workers. Finally, and I hope time permits, I'll, I'll look ahead, 2022, looking at three things, polarization and its antidote, new election laws and redistricting. So um, David, if you're moderating, if I'm going too slow, let me know. Um, let me just say, let me give you a picture of what happened. And this is pre the Georgia outcome. So it only makes the Georgia runoff look even closer. I believe the 2020 election was um, a, a split decision at best, if not a downright tie. Um, yes, the Democrats won the House. They took the Senate by, you know, essentially one vote with um, um, our Vice President uh, Kama, uh, Kamal Harris, but she still has to sit in that seat. The U.S. House, the Democrat Republicans, um, I have to update this, they actually picked up 12 seats. That's probably the biggest change. There were virtually no changes in state legislatures <coughs> or in governorship. Republicans picking up two and one respectively. I'll talk later about redistricting and why the state legislature. So this was very much at, at the, if you were looking at the end game, it was not much of a change. It was a split. Now, as I'll point out, that means not a whole lot changed before and after the election. Yet, obviously, major events like the attack on the Capitol, um, spectacular runoff election for the Democrats in Georgia. Nevertheless, this country, both I'll point out attitudinally, but also politically, is very much split. What needs to be just shown here is that historically, no change elections are very rare. In a presidential election of the sort we've had where the White House changes, particularly when an incumbent president doesn't win re-election, we see other changes. We see state legislatures, we see the Congress. The, the one I wanna point out is legislative chambers. And legislative chambers, that's in the, in the 50 state houses, are very important because in a decennial year as 2020 is, we redraw our district boundaries for everything from Congress to state legislatures to school boards and city council. And if you look in the far right, you'll see only four state chambers switched hands. That's extraordinary. The next lowest number, you have to go back to 1946. So if you want to, you know, you, you say, well, the presidency changed and we've got the Senate, and we've got the House. Do the Democrats really have that? Or do the Republicans really um, simply are a, a two year midterm election away? We'll talk about that later. But again, this sends, tends to reinforce my point about there wasn't much change. Now, where was there change? Look at the turnout. 66, two thirds of all eligible voters in this country voted in the 220 election. You have to go back to 1900 to find an election of eligible voters where the eligible voter turnout was higher. And what makes this extraordinary is in 1900, women, people of color, of any color, could not and did not vote. So when you look at 73, almost 74%, that's on a base of mostly white men, if not exclusively, I should say not mostly, exclusively. You don't get suffrage, you don't get um, real voting rights um, changes until the late 60s, um, and even then the highest turnout rate between 1900 and 2020 would have been what? It would have been the 1960 election, Nixon, Kennedy. So an extraordinarily high turnout race with incredibly little change, with very little change. Telling you probably that in competitive elections, sometimes the outcomes are not very clear or not that de decisive. Another piece of information is how much we spent in this election. Look at 208, 212, and 216. I should have noted these are in constant dollars. They're deflated for whatever rate of inflation there may have been between 208 and 2020. But in 208, 12, and 16, we saw very significant increases in campaign spending for presidential and congressional elections. But look at 220. We went from $6.5 billion, which is already an incredible high number, to almost to more than twice that. We were close to $14 billion spent on presidential and congressional races. This does not include state and local, which could easily increase that number by half. 
So what I'm getting at here is it was a consequential election. We had high turnout, record turnout. We had record spending, but we had what we would call, if not inconclusive, pretty much almost a tie in terms of the actual outcome of the election. Where is the country, however? Well, here is a poll just before the election, and we are as polarized as we ever were in this country. Both Trump and Biden supporters say that if the other wins, it would result in lasting harm to the country. 89% of Trump supporters agree with that, 90% of Biden supporters. So just before, and I'll show you in a moment where this may have changed, each partisan saw the other candidate's election as harmful. And I might add here, lasting harm, not just temporary harm. But since the takeover of the Capitol, Paul, Paul, uh, excuse me, the Pew Charitable Trust, Paul Dunn, after the um, uh, January 6th attack on the Capitol, begins to show you a picture. Trump's ratings nationally dropped from just before the election to 29, 30%, other polls a little higher. And you can see that all the change is among Republicans. He went from a 77% approval rating um, in 2020, late um, uh, in the year, to about 60%. Still, Republicans like him, but more importantly, there is an increasingly, um, if not um, small, even modest growth in the Republican uh, disdain for the president. Among Democrats, none of that change that you saw in the first, you see above here, is due to them. They've never had a positive view of the president. So again, this is a backdrop to what I want to talk about now, which is what was the election really about in terms of um, this issue of um, where we vote and when, when we vote and the COVID-19. By way of background here, this is a project I'm doing with my colleagues at the University of New Mexico in Georgia. The, it's supported by the National Science Foundation. And as of, um, I think it was Saturday evening, we finished um, roughly 20, actually to be exact, 20,100 and I think 94 online surveys with registered voters in all 50 states. State samples range from as small as 200 in relatively small states like the Dakotas and uh, let's say Rhode Island to as many as 1,200 completed interviews in large states like Pennsylvania, California, um, some battleground states like Georgia. The interviews were done right after, not right after the election. We began in November and we kept the survey in the field for all of November, all of December. So it's, it's over 90 days. And we've captured obviously much of the debate over what was going on in the recount, the court challenges, sadly, uh, the attack on the Capitol. We uh, solicited 1.2 million voters and we got a 1.6% response rate. Um, for those of you who think that's low, that's a spectacularly high response rate and surprises me. Um, I can talk at length about the survey. We're just beginning to analyze it, but um, in my 42 years of survey work, um, I've done enough to know when a survey is on and off. And this one seems to be spot on, large part because of the quality of um, the online uh, instrument, but also we didn't ask people so much why they voted for one candidate or another. This survey was all about voting by mail, in person, and the COVID. And it, I think it gives you a picture also about election reform. So we focusing on mail voting experience, We and that's not the gender, but the uh, postal service. We looked at in-person voting experience, voter confidence, election security, and partisan preferences. And I'm going to just give you an, a, a little sampling that will show you, even on a topic as simple as where and when we vote, the electorate is highly polarized and in ways that are um, uh, different than they were in the past. How did you vote in this fall's election? This gives you an idea that 50% of all Americans cast their ballot by mail. Now, all 50 states don't have the same um, laws allowing mail-in voting. All states allow some type of mail-in voting. Our state of Texas, of course, is among the most restrictive. You can only vote by mail if you're over 65 out of the jurisdiction and of course, uh, disabled. And in this election, there was a big debate about what being disabled was. It obviously, according to the AG, did not include either being sick with the COVID virus or being fearful of, of, of contracting it or spreading it. 
28% voted in person early, even though only 36 states have that as an option. So it gives you an idea of how popular that was. And 22% um, voted um, on election day. I don't have the comparative figures here, but trust me to say that in 2016, you could almost reverse these numbers, almost. Um, absentee voting was merely about 15 to 20% of all votes cast. In-person early voting was a little higher and election day was modal. It wasn't 50%, but darn close to it. Look at how people voted. Oh, this is another interesting one. 30% of the sample had voted by mail in a previous election, not necessarily presidential, but 70%, um, excuse me, 70% had voted previously by mail, only 30% said no. So voting by mail is not something that was unknown to the American electorate and particularly to people over 65 and particularly to Republicans. In fact, the highest proportion of people who voted by mail were generally Republicans because Republicans tend to be over 65. And most states that do have restrictive or any type of limitation limit it by age. What we do see, however, is an overwhelming partisan preference for mail-in voting among Democrats. The blue is absentee mail-in, orange is in person, gray is voting on election day. And what's interesting is um, this number here is, I'm giving you the actual number in the sample, but it's closer to about 72% of all Biden supporters voted by mail. And you can begin to see what they were trying to avoid election day in-person voting. But among Republicans or supporters of Donald Trump, I should say, um, it was almost an even random draw as many people voted by mail in person on election day. There are no significant differences here. That's true for third party and other, although in both the third party and other candidates, the modal category was almost always voting by mail. What's also interesting is how confident voters were that their vote was, would be counted or was counted accurately by the candidate's support. So what you're seeing here is that Biden voters overwhelmingly confident and no matter, it was, it was if they, Republican voters were generally not confident or not certain about their vote being counted accurately. So again, vast disparity here. Now, since this survey is conducted after the election starting, I should say after the election, um, on election night, we weren't absolutely certain who won the election, but we find that these numbers don't change between the beginning of our interviewing and even as late as the um, January um, uh, takeover at the um, at Capitol. Um, Republicans had been fed a pretty steady diet of doubt about the accuracy of the election. And generally, they were pretty much uncertain, if not um, un lacking in confidence. This one's real interesting. How confident are you that your vote was counted accurately by way of voting, by method? Now, remember, Democrats overwhelmingly voted by mail. Republicans overwhelmingly voted in person on election day or um, early. Normally, what we see is that absentee voters are much more doubtful about the, uh, or confident about the uh, accuracy that their vote was counted simply because there's always a chain of custody, a worry that the ballot would get delivered to the election officials by the Postal Service on or before election day, that it wouldn't be interfered with. And what we see is the exact opposite. People who voted on election day have no doubt about their ballot getting in to the election officials, or maybe not. And again, not surprisingly, among those people who voted on election day and were least confident about their um, vote being counted accurately or less confident, most were Republicans. So again, this wasn't always about the method of voting. It was whether or not your partisan affiliation and the messaging you had heard um, drove you to believe that there was some problem. Um, the highest rate of not confident at all is among in-person um, election day voters and they were almost exclusively, if not overwhelmingly, um, just overwhelmingly Republican. Here's what's another interesting one. Did you personally witness what you believe to be election fraud? 
we in the survey read them a, a series of things that could be conceived of as election fraud, people who didn't show voter ID, people who claimed to be somebody other than themselves. Um, but the important one is the people who claimed to have seen election fraud were most likely to be in-person early voters, which means that even though the overwhelming majority of voters on election day were Republicans, they were seeing or claimed to have seen more election fraud. We queried them further about this and we just haven't had time to analyze it, but this is a curious kind of finding. We didn't ask if you think there was election fraud. We were asking you, did you see it? And what's interesting is you're more likely to see election fraud. You might think it's easier to see it when you're voting in person, and that's true. You might see somebody attempting to vote for somebody else and filling out their ballot at a nursing home or dropping off multiple ballots at a postal service. But seeing somebody who you don't think should be voting or not showing the proper ID, that's something you have to be there to see. And you would think that in-person early voters and in-person election day voters are more susceptible to that, which they are. But remember, an overwhelming majority of election day voters were Republicans. So they are now seeing more than likely other Republicans voting who shouldn't be voting. We need to look at this more carefully, but it raises a curious, if not a, a, a set of questions that need to be looked at. Oops, I'm sorry. Oops. Have you personally witnessed what you believe to be election fraud? And you begin to see here, and this is interesting, Republicans, almost oh, about a third, yeah, about 20% more likely to have said they saw election fraud than independents, but no Democrats. And what I'm getting at here is that this last slide really does tell you the story. Most of these voters who voted in person on election day and saw a fraud about 20% are the same Republicans and mostly Republicans. Democrats, not much. People who voted absentee, it's probably about 15%. Democrats, something in the area of about two or 3%. So again, this is very much a partisan phenomenon. So the big takeaway here is that there was a lot going on in this election. Much of it was driven, I believe, by the president and his supporters claiming that the way we vote and where we vote and when we vote is subject to more fraud. And that these messages are showing up not only in the way Republicans were voting, but in fact, how they were perceiving or claiming to perceive what was going on in the election. It should be no surprise to any of us that at least 72% of all self-identified Republicans and probably um, a higher number among people who supported President Trump knowing there's some Republicans that didn't vote for, for, for Trump, um, believe that the election was stolen. Um, we can see it in their behavior. Um, Republicans, I think I've told you before, many Republicans here in Harris County that we surveyed before the election who had a long history of voting by mail told us and eventually showed us that they would not vote in person on election day, choosing, um, excuse me, not vote by mail and choose to vote on election day or in person early, um, largely, we think based on the messaging they were getting from the president. Um, let me turn to a, a local issue here, and that is um, straight ticket voting. Um, so here are the questions I wanna ask are, and this gets to the question of what are we gonna see in the future? Um, Republicans have instituted a bunch of changes in election laws over the last decade, maybe even 20 years. Voter ID laws, limited voter registration, curtailment of in-person early voting. All, and then of course, limited um, opportunities to vote by mail. One of the big changes in 2016 going into 2020 was that the Republican legislature in 218 banned the straight ticket voting option on your ballot, where you hit one button and you vote for all the candidates. The thinking here was that Republicans, Democrats, excuse me, are more likely it was to vote straight straight ticket, and they would not do that if they had to go all the way down to the ballot. I personally think this is somewhat of a, 
a racist view of the Democratic electorate, but I wouldn't impute motives to anyone other than to suggest that um, it was um, at least a, a less than um, flattering characterization of Democrats and their vote. But the question becomes, who votes straight ticket? How do we measure straight ticket voting without the straight ticket um, ballot choice? Did the removal of the straight ticket choice on the 2020 ballot affect down ballot voting in Texas and Harris County? And were Democrats or Republicans advantaged or disadvantaged by the removal of the straight ticket or did it make no difference? I apologize for how I'm gonna present this, but it's pretty data heavy, so stay with me. How do I measure drop-off rate in the 2016 and 2020 elections? Well, the way to think about it is you walk into the voting booth and you vote for the first race on the ballot. The first race on the ballot in 2016 and 2020 was for president of the United States. By the time you get through about 64 other races, you get to the bottom of the ballot. And the bottom of the ballot would include races like district attorney. If there is straight ticket voting, then contest should be, and, and contest should be partisan and if possible consistent over time. The difference between the total number of votes voted for president and the total number of votes voted for district attorney of any candidate, any party, should be about the same. With straight ticket voting, you would expect that drop off to be less than if you didn't have it. If you thought it was going to help a Democrat, you would expect that the drop off would have no effect on Democratic share of vote and a greater and negative effect on the share of vote for Republicans. So what did I do? And, and, and let's just look at the raw numbers. And, and I'm sorry, in 204, I'm going back well before the change, 31% of voters cast a straight Democratic ballot compared to 18% um, of, uh, I apologize, voters who, who, who uh, cast a straight Republican. In 2016, those numbers went up dramatically. 42% of voters cast a straight tick, a Democratic ballot, 25% cast a straight Republican ballot. What you can conclude from this in the aggregate is that it was Republicans who were more likely to split their ballot than Democrats. Now, these are people who punched the straight ticket button. There's another way to measure it, and that is to actually look at the total number of votes cast in each race for each candidate among all voters, but we're not allowed to see those ballots. Those would have to physically, I'd have to see every person's ballot. So we, we really only have a way of teasing this out, which we call the undervote. But the critical point here is when Republicans got rid of the straight ticket, they were assuming that they would depress straight ticket voting among Democrats, when in fact, the problem may have been, may have been the willingness of Republicans to split their ballot. Or the better way to pose the question is, does the opportunity to hit a straight ticket make somebody vote straight ticket? Or is somebody's predisposition to vote straight ticket, is it facilitated by the button or will the button make no difference? If you want to do something, will the opportunity to vote at a straight ticket button make it easier or less likely for you to do it? And similarly for Republicans, if they want to split their ticket, how is this going to diminish their likelihood of splitting their ticket? So what I did in this particular is I calculated the share of presidential voters who cast a vote a choice in the Harris County District Attorney's race in 216 and 220 for 972 precincts. The drop-off rate is the difference between the votes cast in the presidential election over the votes cast in the attorney general election. That's all. If there are 100 votes for president and only 50 votes for the attorney general race, then the drop-off race rate was 50%. And actually, I apologize. I should have reversed those. The vote for attorney general should be on top. And, I, and that is my error. The estimate then I try to do is estimate the relationship between the share of the vote received by each candidate in the Harris County District Attorney's contest and the drop-off 
in votes cast as a proportion of votes cast in the presidential contest. That slope, that ratio, is the percent of vote gained or lost by each candidate with a 1% change in drop-off. So let's actually look at the election, the vote share by presidential um, and district attorney candidates. In 216, Trump got 34%, and Anderson, um, uh, Bevan Anderson, who ran in 216, with Ms. Huffman in 220, actually received more votes as a percent of votes cast than President Trump. And this is pretty much the roll off. There were people um, who voted for Anderson who could not vote for Trump. That was in 216. In 216, Clinton received 59% of the vote and Kim Og, the um, current district attorney, won 59. No, no evidence of roll off at all. This is of course what the Republicans wanted to get rid of. They were hoping that maybe some of the Clinton supporters, and I, again, I apologize for the typos here, but look at 2020. Trump still runs a little bit behind Ms. Huffman. He only got 37% of the vote in Harris County. Ms. Huffman actually got a percent more, but Biden actually ran ahead of Kim Og. Kim Og was an incumbent. She was running for election, running against Ms. Huffman. And uh, Biden actually got a 5% advantage. Now, the danger in, if you just looked at these numbers, you'd say it worked. But this is not the way to ask the question, did their, did their drop off actually affect Kim Og's vote? Could there have been other reasons why um, District Attorney Kim Og didn't get as high a percentage of vote as Biden? And if you're familiar with uh, Kim Og's uh, term as incumbent District Attorney, there were many people who were critical of her. She had a primary challenge. She had been accused of not being uh, consistent with her campaign promises from 216. And there is some reason to believe that even among Democrats, the level of enthusiasm for her may have waned. So let's look, and this is very complicated and I apologize, but all I'm doing here is asking, is the percent of drop off positively or negatively related to the share of vote that I got in 16 I got in 20, Anderson got in 16, or Huffman got in 20. And if you look at these tables carefully, the B simply tells you that for every percent increase in the drop-off rate, what percent of vote did Kim Og gain or lose? So if you go over to um, Kim Og in 216, there's this, there is no relationship. The B, the slope, is not, P means significant, O5 or smaller. If you look at each of these graphs, there's only one where the O5 level is met. O6 and 216 is not a, a winner, but every percentage increase that occurred in the drop-off between Trump and Anderson in 216 decreased by about 7.75% the vote that Anderson got. In 220, Huffman was losing almost a full percentage point for every percent drop off there was between her vote ca cast of DA's race and the vote cast for President Trump. In neither 16 or 20 did Kim Og suffer from roll off with or without the straight ticket option. Now there's more analysis to be done here, but what I'm getting at is that sometimes candidates, political parties propose election reforms they think are gonna advantage their party and their candidates. And they don't really look at it carefully enough. Now there are many, many, many other variables here that would determine the vote for um, Og in 16 and 20. I have the same two presidential Republican candidates and the same two district attorney Democratic candidates. The only thing that differed between these two elections was Huffman and Anderson. Both, one was an incumbent, one was a challenger. There may have been other reasons why Ogg's vote even dropped a little bit. But what I'm trying to get at here is, as I say to Democrats and Republicans alike, be careful what you wish for. The adoption of this particular election um, reform, and I use that word loosely, was intended, of course, by the Republicans 
to make people read their ballot and study the candidates and make informed choices. The more cynical view was they knew that Democrats are more likely to vote straight ticket and they didn't want to make it any easier for them. But what I'm showing you here is if any candidate, down ballot candidate was disadvantaged in the 2020 election here in Harris County, at least, it was the Republican candidate Huffman. Now there are other races. I chose a district attorney's race because it was the lowest on the ballot that was still countywide. We voted for a county uh, attorney, a, you know, county attorney, district attorney, county clerk, and help me get tax assessor. Um, and those are countywide. There are races that are lower on the ballot, but they're not countywide races. So I can't look at all 900 plus precincts. What I will make an argument for in a moment um, is that going forward in 2022, you expect the Texas state legislature to do things like curtail mail-in voting, curtail in-person early voting, attempt to restrict um, voter ID further, requiring it for uh, mail-in ballots, attempting to um, prohibit, for instance, things like mailing out applications for mail ballots. What I'm getting at is that the electorate is large, it is diverse, and it is not either monolithically conservative, liberal, Democrat or Republican, nor on, old or young. And many of these reforms don't always have their targeted effect. Um, before I move on, let me just also say that this is still a work in progress um, and it needs a little bit more um, estimation. Uh, one of the ways I can pull out how Kim Og might have done in 2020 um, is to look at some of the um, proportion of voters who might have been reluctant to vote for her, particularly I believe African-Americans who were angry at her for some of the um, uh, efforts she made um, to hold up bail bond reform um, that got a lot of press in the uh, primary. Um, moving on, if I'm right about polarization, um, the question I suppose is, is it the new normal or is it just the old normal? Um, what I'll argue is that uh, a man named David Mayhew at Yale published a book in 19, 2017, and he argues very simply that what we see today is hardly new, that we've witnessed this type of severe and significant polarization um, throughout American history. He looks at the 1850s and 70s, the 1950s and McCarthyism, the 1960s and 1970s in Vietnam. I'd even argue that you could go back before the 1850s and look at the um, emergence of the two-party system um, as a similar uh, polarization between rural and, 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 and urban and industrialized areas. Um, but what Mayu argues is that in each of these periods, there was an effort to address polarization and his argument is that we basically used what he called inventive policy. So look at these acts. Some of you may not be familiar with them. I'll go through them slowly. But in 1787, when this country was racked by Shays and the Whiskey Rebellions, when um, there was insurrection, people didn't want to pay taxes either to the federal or state governments, not unlike what happened on January 6. People attacked, killed other people. The Northwest Ordinance Act was enacted in order to identify ways to unify the country. If you're familiar with it, among other things, it built the first federal highway system, the first turnpike. Um, I trust you all know where the word turnpike came from. It was a pike, a big stem of a tree, and it went across the road, and you had to turn the pike to let the cattle or the wagon get across, and the only way you got that pike to open or turn was to pay a fee. The Northwest Ordinance Act provided money to every county in every state to build parts of the what's now known as the National Highway. Um, it was the rock bed of uh, essentially 95, uh, excuse me, not 95, um, help me here, I-75. The Northwest Ordinance Act also gave to every county in every state federal land and monies to pay for the building of public schools and for the financing of teachers and books for those public schools. It was, you would use it as their conventional pork barrel. Everybody got a piece of the pie and nobody was restricted. And the idea here was to create legislative enactments that everybody could, so to speak, drink at the trough of. 
The land grant colleges were known as the Morale Act, Morale, Morale, Morale Act of 1862 and 1890, established, of course, land grant colleges. And, and these colleges, whether they were the University of Wisconsin, Michigan, throughout the South, again, were publicly financed public institutions of higher education that went to every jurisdiction and every state in the union. The Highway Trust Fund, a variant of the Northwest Ordinance Act, created what we call the National Defense Highway Act. This was an action that Eisenhower took. And he said in many, many, many stories talk about um, his experience as a uh, cavalry and later on a um, tank officer and his fear that roads did not connect across counties. But the other one was he just wanted to build a highway system so he could begin to distribute resources to all the 50 states so that the members of the House and Senate would feel like they all had a, so to speak, piece of the pie. I could go on with the Clean Water Act, the National Science Foundation, but let me suggest to you that as we sit here or in our homes, President Biden is doing the same thing. What he calls the COVID-19 Relief Act is a huge pot of money to go everywhere with the idea that you will give pieces of the pie, not to just West Virginia or to New York, but to every burg in town. And in fact, I thought it was interesting when I was reading the act that he was proposing, it was gonna give money up to households with $300,000 a year family incomes. Now that, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, the Republicans or the 10 Republicans pointed out it's too much. And it, you can imagine what he's gonna say okay, it might be too much, let's cut it back. Maybe the $15 an hour wage, uh, minimum wage increase will be too much. But what Biden is doing, I think, is taking a page from previous presidents. In times of national crisis, create large, broad spending programs that benefit everyone. And those of us who are, um, I'm not old enough to remember it, but the 1930s saw, of course, the WPA and the Public Works Administration, the PWA, they were nothing but just employment, make work programs for everyone that was unemployed, both in the public and private sector. Now, whether that works or not remains to be seen, but in any one of these cases I, I point out here, votes for the Northwest to land grants, the Highway Trust Fund, of these, only the Highway Trust Fund and the Water, Clean Water Act got what I would call oversized unanimous majorities. Most of them passed with small majorities and came to become programs that have become entrenched in American public policy. Land grant colleges, highways, clean water, national science, the St. Lawrence Seaway. Something else that these projects also did, particularly the ones that President Biden wants to do, among other things, he wants to put money into infrastructure, rebuilding road, bridges and roads, helping out at, at airports. And what Eisenhower said is, if you build an international, a interstate highway system, you can let people go to places they've not been before, see places and meet people they have not met before and do it cheaply in their cars with low cost gasoline, or in our case, clean energy and electric cars. Um, let me, and I hope I'm not going, you know, I am going along, I apologize. Let me just point out what's coming up. We're gonna get a revision of a lot of state election laws. Battleground states like Georgia, Washington, and Pennsylvania are moving to restrict what we'll call convenience modes of voting, like mail-in and in-person early voting. Um, uh, further, we'll see enforcement of voter ID and, and registration re um, requirements. What I'm gonna suggest here is the consequences of these proposed changes are not obvious and their partisan advantages, um, even though they may curtail convenience voting, may not advantage one party over the other. They may convince Republicans that they're doing something, but they may not. And more importantly, they may add costs to conducting elections, such as long lines, waiting times, lower rates of ballot completion. And these may have what I call a bipartisan effect. Um, bring me back another day and I'll tell you about um, studies on waiting to vote. Many of the conveniences that we have created, whether they are in-person early voting, mail-in voting, um, election day vote centers, where you can vote anywhere on election day, all reduce the pressures on wait times, long lines, reneging, and the dollar costs, it costs a lot of money to run elections. Since 2000, the cost per vote cast in this country across 3000 jurisdictions has gone up 40%, 40% from about $4.50 in 
to almost $7 per vote. So that's a lot of money to be spending on voting when we're trying to fight a, a pandemic to say nothing of other social ills. Um, as I said before, um, redistricting becomes really important. It tells my story about why most of the changes that have occurred still keep the Republicans in control. 67 of 99, oops, sorry, uh, state legislatures um, are controlled by Republicans. Redistricting in 2020 will not be constrained by federal voting rights law. The Shelby decision has gotten rid of preclearance. So those of us who do redistricting will no longer have to file with the Justice Department and be pre-cleared before any elections can be held under those new redistricting plans in what we call voting rights states, which are really the old Confederacy. Um, the Supreme Court is not likely to change any of this. Um, I would expect the 20 midterm elections to be tilted heavily in favor of the Republicans, but be careful. Tilted doesn't mean they'll win. I'll go so far as to say the redistricting is going to be a mixed bag because 19 states of 20 of 50 have now moved to fully or partially um, what we call nonpartisan or professional commissions. And the other is, and we can talk about this at length, the Republicans confront in states like Texas a problem. They will have at least two and probably three new congressional seats. They'll go from 36 to 39. But they have lost Republican voters. Now, what do I mean by that? I don't mean that Republican voters have become independents or Democrats. They have died. It's simple. They've gone to that electoral precinct in the heavens. They're not around. When you look at the replacement rate between 16 and 18 and 20, what you find is there's just not enough Republican voters to go around. And one of the problems for the redistricting um, effort on the part of the Republicans in Texas, which they'll control, is that though they may create a Republican district in 2020, by 2024, 26, 28, the morphing of districts, the movement of people may make those, make those districts, whether they're congressional or state house, weaker. Um, I'm gonna, I see David looking at me and I'm gonna stop there. I probably went too long and I'll be happy to share my slides and answer any of your questions. Let me end that. Bob, thank you uh, on behalf of all of us that always full, uh, always leave our heads and our hearts full. And uh, many questions have come up. So we wanna jump right into that. And I'm gonna um, hand on, um, tag team with Mark here as we get through some, I've tried to group the questions that have come in into categories. So starting with, uh, there are a couple, one was a comment, one of the question that addressed toward the legislature. Um, one person pointing out uh, that he's seen a lot of bills filed, proposed to address voting integrity, I'm putting that in air quotes, um, not so much on opening up rights to vote. And so the companion question is that, is there proposed legislation in the upcoming session? And I think there are some bills that have been filed, but I'll let you comment on that, that, will make, that would make it easier for people to vote. And I'll add to register uh, whether we are still in a pandemic or not. Yeah, there, there is. I mean, Boris Miles, uh, many of the Democratic um, uh, members of the Senate and House have filed what I will call uh, pro-voter bills. By that, I mean things that would make it easier for voters to vote. Um, there is one that I think, in fairness to the, the Republicans, there will be a bill to introduce what we call online voter registration um, and to allow um, particularly online re-registration. I think that'll get through. Why? Think about it. Older voters tend to be more Republican. They tend to move later in their lives. This is something that Republicans have wanted for a long time. It will not, it'll do two things. It will save a lot of money, particularly for county. Um, and it will, of course, have what I will call a nonpartisan effect. Online registration is just simply, it's ridiculous now where you have to actually, you know, apply for a ballot, uh, re-registration ballot and get it sent in the mail. Um, and, and mail processing is really, U.S. postals are expensive. But I do believe the Republicans will go move to do three things that I think they will succeed at. One, they'll restrict the number of days and hours of in-person early voting. Two, they'll restrict the number of locations in which in-person early voting can take place, particularly removing a Sunday or, or um, church-oriented you know, this is souls to the polls um, and particularly black communities. And I think they will institute a requirement in order to get a mail ballot to um, send in a facsimile or photocopy of your driver's license. Um, let me just say this. There was much made about mail voting in Texas, in Texas and it was um, um, uh, not, it, it just didn't grow as heavily as it grew in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin or for that matter, even in, in a state like Michigan. Um, the fight over people um, who are, claiming to be disabled um, because of COVID actually scared a lot of voters away. And more importantly, the question about whether or not the Postal Service could deliver the ballots. And then when the Attorney General restricted 
drop-off locations to just one per county. I think that sort of backfired. I have evidence, again, I haven't done all the analysis, but the people most disadvantaged by that were Republicans. To give you an example, you know that you could vote at Toyota Center and several other drive-in locations. Uh, there were 11 in the county, or maybe it was 12, I can't remember. Um, so there were about 180,000 people who used the drive-through locations. I did. A majority, a majority of them were, not David, Rabbi Siegel, a majority of them were Republican. Most people who used the drive-through were Republicans. And, and, and why might that be? Well, if you look at Republicans, what proportion of them compared to Democrats have single passenger vehicle cars per person? It's more likely that a voter is, who has a, a, a single person passenger vehicle available to them, not a car that David shares with a canter, one car in the household. And I've actually looked at this. And that's exactly what was happening here. Again, one of my close friends whose name will go and mention Robert Hara, a fine political consultant. When I, I showed him this data, I said, how is it that somebody like Betancourt, smart guy, state senator, he said, don't think that they're that smart. And number two, ask yourself, who are they appealing to? If you want an explanation for this, here's the simple one. Look at those slides I showed you about Republicans believing there was voter fraud, that they couldn't trust their vote to be counted accurately. They don't know that for a fact, but they believe it. If they believe it, they can be convinced that a candidate or an office holder that won't support election laws that restrict mail-in voting is not loyal to their party and their candidates. I believe that many, many Republicans voted for things like voter ID, knowing it was a waste of money and would not have a, a, a dramatic effect on decreasing a turnout, but did so for fear that they would be tea party by some more conservative candidate who said they weren't faithful to supporting election integrity and reform. Sometimes the truth isn't the reason why people do things. They do it because they believe it. And once that belief becomes entrenched among a particular group of voters, in this case, Republican primary voters, if you look at Republican primary voters in this country and in Texas, they are much more likely to believe in voter fraud than the general election voter and even a general election Republican voter, not primary voter. So if you're running for re-election and you say, I'm not going to vote for voter ID because it's going to cost us $28 million and have no appreciable effect on voter integrity, you could get defeated in a primary. I think that's one of the explanations for it. Sorry for the long one. Can I ask a quick, a quick follow-up to that? Uh, it came up in some conversations we were having with some strategists around HB 1026, which is um, it's a little bit in the weeds, but it would restrict uh, the VDR, the, the volunteer deputy registrars. And... Um, I guess how how does making registration available online like could that go together with like what what would be the role of VDRs if there's a very good question. Um, I mean, uh, deputy registrars, which you know they can still they're they're under terrible restrictions. You have to be trained. You have to do online training, which is not inconsequential, but you know it, it's fair. But you know you can't count you you have to hand in your ballots within 24 hours. Particular signatures can't do it out of the county. I don't know. I, I would effectively believe that if you got online registration, particularly Democratic and pro-voter um, groups, would probably put more of their time and effort into getting people to do it online than the, the laborious task of training a deputy registrar. I think deputy registrars work two places really, really well. College campuses, where you have you know congestion of students who are probably not registered, and it's easy to contact them with COVID. It's not so easy. And the other place would be um, uh, what I call residential um, housing, which would be a really the fancy word for nursing homes um, also, um, where you can walk in and register lots of people and they're not moving around um, and, they're, and they're at the same location. But it's, it's an interesting question. I'm not promising uh, online registration. I'm just saying of all the reforms, it's the one, um, Paul Batten and Court and I are, are I, I, I count them as a friend. He's a decent human being. Um, I don't agree with him on anything, maybe maybe even the time of day. But um, he even said to me, he thought that one would, would, would get through. And it almost did before. Um, the problem here is, um, you know, it depends on uh, the, the research on this stuff. When I go to these hearings or when I did in person, I'm just shocked. At, I can't believe Republican consultants don't look at the, I mean, they get paid a lot of money. They should be doing better work. And I'm not saying my work is definitive on this, but I think that somebody has to kind of shake their head and say, what happened here? If, if Ms. Huffman actually was a victim of, of down ballot roll off, is that a good thing 
for Republicans to have implemented. And then I can tell you there's some bad things with not having straight ticket voting, which is um, had it not been COVID, I think lines would have been longer, time to take the vote would be longer, and uh, there might have been consequences. So uh, Dr. Spencer, thank you so much. And there are some more specific questions about straight party voting, but I wanted just to broaden the discussion. And, and by the way, first of all, I want to thank you for clarifying that you don't have first-hand knowledge of the WPA um, earlier. So we were, you know, clarifying. Well, I'm only about five. <laughs> just missed it. But, uh, um, so, you know, you mentioned, so 66.4% voter turnout, which was the highest, you know, since 1900. Uh, what factors do you think will sustain high voter turnout going forward in 22 and, and 24? And what factors uh, could push it the other way, can, can push it down? It's a very good question. And it's one I kind of hinted at before. Um, I'll speculate. I'm not going to give you anyone who starts making pronostications about the future is just, just a silly person. First, I think we know from research that the best predictor of voting is, is, is what I call the Steve Martin. How to make a million dollars. First, get a million dollars. The best predictor of voting is voting. We know that once a voter starts voting, it becomes a bad habit. One of the things we saw in this election, and it goes back to 218 actually, started in 218, was that a large proportion of the electorate who had not, not only been not registered, but of course not voting. And I'm not talking about 18 year olds who were coming of age. I'm talking a proportion of the population under the age of 45, over the age of 25, who had not been registered and therefore had not voted were the highest turnout group. They had the biggest delta between 16, 18, and 20. Between 16 and 18, they were the highest new voters and they continued that trend through 20. Who are these voters? They were decidedly, of course, as I said, under 45. That to me is young. I hope Mark and I can agree on young being under 45. Rabbi Siegel's, you know, barely shaving these days. But more importantly, yeah, the color of these voters, they were decidedly non-Anglo. And they, if you had to pick a modal group in that, it was young Latinos, young Latin women. They were turning out, they were registering, and they were voting. Um, I've done similar work. One of the things I've also noticed is that when you say to somebody, I voted, you know, like Davis, I voted. Well, what does it mean to vote? You showed up at the polls, you got a ballot, but did you vote for all the races on the ballot? Voting is made up of two components. It's showing up, right? We all know that. Showing up is often not enough to do something, but filling out that whole ballot, whether it's a straight ticket in, New, in Texas or New Jersey. One of the things we've noticed is that young voters vote a full ballot. That's not true of all their older counterparts. Finally, this is something that may not be good for the Democrats in the room. Be careful what you wish for. Higher turnout isn't traditionally, well, I should say, higher turnout has traditionally been associated with more democratic voting because the democratic base was always underperforming. Young people, people of color, people who move around, the poor. That wasn't the case in 2020. What we saw was that in groups of voters who had voted for the first time between 216 and 220, many Latina, Latino males in that 40, 25 to 45 voted, who had not voted in either the 16 and the 18 election, and at a higher percentage, they voted for Trump. No, they're not a majority, but somewhere between six and eight percentage points higher. Inexperienced, infrequent voters are not like frequent voters, which means they're not attentive to politics. They don't read about politics. They don't talk about politics. They don't know people who do that. They don't hang with those people. And consequently, their vote decisions are influenced by factors different than their counterparts, Latino men, who are more frequent voters. And so one of the things we found was that people who were voting, Latin, Latino voters, males, particularly under 45, for the first time, would cite the economy and jobs as a major reason for their vote choice. But their counterparts, above 45 and below, but who had simply voted in either or 16 and 18, they talked about immigration, DACA, and COVID. So what I'm trying to suggest here is that you don't always, in the case of Hispanic voters particularly, um, there is this tendency to think of them as a monolithic group of voters, and they weren't. 
Um, so this going forward, what does it mean? I think that the Democrats have enjoyed very robust turnout and successful turnout. By that I mean they're winning elections. I believe that their turnout will hold up. In Texas, for instance, between a presidential and a midterm election, the average drop off for Democratic vote is 12 to 15 points. For Republicans, the average drop off is somewhere between 10 and less. In this election, 18, there was only a five point differential in turnout rate among Democrats and Republicans from the 216 election. We'll see what happens in 2022. My theory is that the Democrats will hold their base. And the real question is, can the Republicans? And the first evidence, and I want to make clear, it's a very weak piece of evidence. One state in a, in a general election runoff shows that Republican base voters failed to match their turnout rates in the previous general and fell behind, significantly behind Democratic turnout enough to give the Democrats not only the victory in those two seats, but by margins better than they had done in the general election. I think that will continue if they're Trump versus and fill in the blank for what other Republicans. Trump had a depressing effect. If he doesn't endorse a candidate in the Republican primary in battleground states, and I can't say that in New York, I can't say that in California, but I can talk about places like Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Missouri, Georgia, North Carolina, I think soon to be Texas, then that can make a difference in the general election. To me, the most vulnerable Republican is not who we all think it is, Mr. Paxson or Attorney General, twice indicted. No, the most vulnerable Republican is the governor. And he's not vulnerable in a general election as much as he's vulnerable in a primary. Do I think he'll win this primary? Yes. But if Mr. West, the chairman of the Republican Party of Texas, has his way, he could nominate a candidate that would surely be defeated in November. So again, right now the Democrats aren't strong enough to defeat Abbott, but Abbott's strong enough to defeat himself. And I, again, I don't predict that, but I think what you're looking at is a Republican Party that may have you know, a two thirds Trump majority and a one third minority somebody else. And not enough to lose a primary, but not enough to go into a general election. And I think the biggest problem for Democrats, I think has largely been solved. Now the question is, can these election reforms I use the word reforms, changes, depressed turnout. And I will tell you that my colleagues who study this are very skeptical about how many election laws can be changed to diminish voter turnout. I, for one, have never seen any convincing evidence that voter ID has suppressed or significantly suppressed voter turnout. Nor have I, the only reform I've ever seen that has a significant effect on voter turnout is what we call vote by mail elections, all vote by mail, like Colorado, Oregon, and Washington have and election day vote centers. That's been the two that have dramatically increased turnout. Um, and then the, in both cases, I want to be very clear here, in both cases, vote by mail elections, all vote by mail, where everybody's mailed the ballot, and election day vote centers that let you, you know, vote early. It's like early voting on election day have no partisan advantage. So they increase turnout. And if somebody says, well, how can an increased turnout not help the Democrats? Well, bring me back another day and I'll explain it. But um, those are the two reforms I think, should they be changed, my sense is they still don't have any partisan effect. Right, right. but the perception is, is very distinct from, from reality. Well, public perception is often molded by what the candidates will tell their voters they wanna hear, sort of the echo chamber. And I think one of the dangers that Republicans have been talking about, I think Mitch McConnell, if you read the, there's a great story in the New York Times today about, it's just chronicling the 77 days since the election. And what was most interesting is Mitch McConnell, who went from, you know, the president has a right to challenge the election. What was Mitch McConnell doing? He was, he was what's the right word here? He was hoping the president would campaign for the two Republican senators so he would control the Senate. I don't mean that in a kind of self-interested way. He's a, he's a loyal Republican. He felt not happy about what the president had done. But when he found out the president wasn't going to do that, and in fact cost him the election, I don't think anybody believes otherwise in the Republican Party. What he effectively was doing was saying, you're not much of a party leader. Let's get rid of you. But again, 
too little, too late. And it's very clear after Mr. McCarthy went down to the Largo, um, Mar Mar Largo, Mar Mar Largo, Largo. excuse me. Um, you forgot already. Republican, they're in for a dime. They're in for a dollar. I don't see how they can. They can't win with Trump. They may not be able to lose with Trump either. Um, but the truth of the matter is, it's all a question of the of the arena. I wouldn't be shocked to see. I don't know if you've been following it, but there are people like Hawley and even Cruz who are saying, let's get rid of the Electoral College. You know what I mean? Well, all I know is we can win when we have you uh, come and talk to us. So uh, thank you. we are we're going to have to have you back for a uh, for a third round. So thank you so much. My best. Tell Paul Colbert I'm going to answer his question by typing it in. Um, David, any any uh, any last words before I I close it? Uh, bring it home. I mean, just ditto to everything we're, we definitely, I think we're going to look at, at part three, getting that on the calendar. And uh, especially with the session, maybe going through the summer with redistricting, uh, we'll have a lot more to talk about over a longer stretch. So lots of opportunities to learn from you. Maybe you'll help us uh, lobby too. some of these legislators who need to hear, hear your science. So <laughs> I don't want to hear from you. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Stein, thank you so much. Uh, it is a pleasure for ADL. Uh, to work with uh, the RAC Texas, and uh, we look forward to doing it again. Uh, remember, uh, voting matters regardless of the election, and, and there will be many elections in between now and in 2022. Uh, so please uh, be active. Uh, your vote makes a difference. Uh, please also be involved. Uh, the Texas legislators, legislature is meeting right now. Um, there are many issues that are going to be affecting our future in so many ways, including on voting rights. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, RAC Texas is holding um, some training sessions on February 16th and 17th. Uh, you'll be receiving information, uh, and I think the links were put in the chat, but you also will be receiving information um, after this uh, webinar on uh, how to train, on how to lobby, uh, and about their democracy protection campaign. So please look for that. Also, please look for some upcoming ADL um, webinars, uh, including some of our legislation uh, on backspace hate that we're going to be uh, uh, pushing out. I think that's on February 10th. You'll be receiving information about that. Um, and just stay tuned, stay aware, and thank you all so much for uh, tuning in. Have a good night. Good night.